and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, a, a writer of Grimdark, a lady of probably way too many hair colorings, and the cr and the creator of We Men of Ash and Shadow, the one and only Holly Tinsley. How are you doing today? I am very well, thank you. How are you? I'm do I'm doing good. Um, I ha I ha since it's a, since it's a Saturday, I can actually I can actually get away with having a little extra in my coffee. Well, I've, I've, I mean, I'm on the wine, so, you know, that's, I probably should have started with the coffee and worked up to the wine, but I just, you know, I thought I'd just skip ahead. I have to do, I have to deal with crazy time zones, so what, so what is morning and evening for me is, um, a matter of, a matter of interpretation. This is a, this is true, this is a good point. I will point out that it is evening where I am, so it's like six. 30-ish, so, uh, you know, it's not like a, I'm not just sat drinking wine first thing. No. But, when it comes, when, now when it comes to, um, when it comes to it, just, ri just writing in general, um, what, what kind of, what kind of bit you when it came, when it came to the writing bug to act, actually pursue your own form of fiction? I was actually, you know, I'm actually I've been listening to um, sort of Clues podcast earlier, and I, I realised that you always start the podcast with asking about the the origin story, so where people mm -hmm. started from. Yeah. Um, and I just I, I spent all afternoon this afternoon thinking I've got to come up with a really interesting origin story to kind of explain my path, my writer's journey. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I didn't think of anything interesting. So uh, the truth is, it was not a very linear process to get to where I am uh, today with writing. I, I did start from a very young age. I remember writing when I was school age and writing a lot of uh, fantasy and kind of historical um, fiction. And I think I, I think I probably wrote a, a few really terrible science fictions as well. But I... I stopped probably writing for, I mean, a long time when I went to college and I started pursuing other creative outlets. So I did music and I did drama and I did art and uh, all sorts of other things. And then I didn't come back to writing until I think it was about three years ago. I'd been doing writing in a business sense um, for quite a long time. So I'd, I'd, I'd write kind of training manuals and blogs for businesses and things like that but nothing that was creative and I wrote a couple of blogs and uh, got a message off a friend of mine who's an author who said do you realize that this is this is what you should be doing you should be writing stuff mm -hmm. and that coincided with losing the job that I had then the the company that I was with they uh, kind of they went bust and then they restructured and uh, you know they kind of downscaled everything so I lost my job and I was in a, a kind of mentally conflicted place and I just thought you know what I thought I'm I'm just gonna go for this and try and write a book and I wrote my first novel I think I wrote in six weeks which is not the one that I've published but I do intend to go back to and I think I finished writing that novel and I just thought, okay, this is this is what I'm going to do now. And that was three years ago. And I, I haven't been back to a proper, what I would call a proper job since. So, yeah, it's it's not the most linear way to get there. But, you know, I, I've kind of found my way to it a bit later. Well, everybody has their um th their different paths to where, to where they're going. So it's... And... As far as far as making that making that kind of story interesting or not or not interesting, um, I never graded on on level of interest. It's just th it's just this is the path that someone had um taken. Yeah, yeah. 
Now, and I, within the within, but within that sto within that story, there is the amount of um, articles that you've written on a lot of different a lot of different topics. Was was blog writing um, originally a means to ju to just um, get wor get words out there instead of instead of writing it and then and then DNFing? It was in a sense uh, when I very first started blogging. I mean, I was blogging about kind of subjects that, you know, I didn't really have any personal interest in. So I was blogging for like marketing companies and mm -hmm. uh, people would approach me and say, you know, we've got this new hedge trimmer, like, or whatever coming out. Can you do us a blog for us? And from that, I started, I developed into writing about things that I was interested in. So uh, I started, I wrote for about a, a year to 18 months for a, a company that do board games and pop culture, like memorabilia and gifts. Mm -hmm. So, and then from that point, I kind of started moving more into like my own areas of, of interest. Um. But yeah, it's it started out really as just a part of my my everyday kind of day job that I was doing anyway. Mm -hmm. And did you um give did you have a did you have a fair amount of experience when it came to when it came to board games up at that point? In terms of playing them, <laughs> yes, and I mean that's probably still like the, the truth today is that. I, I write a lot about kind of games and, and pop culture and movies and films, but I write from kind of the perspective of someone who is a fan, but also someone who's not particularly knowledgeable about them. So it's a lot of what I do is just kind of getting different games and like I play them, play some with my family and kind of just talk about them. But I tend not to go so much into the mechanics uh, of, of things. So... Which... Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I pretty much just write about doing what I enjoy doing, which is just kind of sitting around and just kind of playing different games or like mm -hmm. watching films. <clears throat> which definitely makes sense. Um, and I, I was, I was going to make some, some joke about, about one of them being Catan, but that would have been too easy because, <laughs> Catan, because Catan is everywhere. Yes. Yeah, very much. It's kind of like, it's kind of like mentioning Dungeons and Dragons, which obviously I I love, but it's just it's the first thing that everybody will go to when they're talking about kind of RPG and games. And since you've seen my output, you you're probably familiar with the fact that I try and minimize how much I talk about um, D and D. Yes, yes, I said that would be my only mention. <laughs> we, we'll we'll just kind of skirt around that. Um. Well. I don't skirt. I I don't skirt. I don't um avoid it as hard as I used to. I I used to. It's just that what I focus on nowadays is more of, um, the th the third party end of things and the part the parts that are that aren't getting talked about by so many other um so many other cha so many other channels in my particular space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Although um. Although the although the plus the um, I've seen some people do the whole adapt do the whole adapting different um, different characters and other media into D and D, and I just I just I just roll my eyes because because some of that some of their um character choices are so are would be so out of place with any edition of D and D that you may as well just use anything else, um. But what? But um, that particular thing bring, brings me to the kind of story that um, we men of Ash and Shadow is intent is intended to be. <clears throat> now, yeah, there are two tags that you've associated with the book that I'm cu that I'm curious on your interpretation of, because. Obviously, I've I've done my fair share of um, deep diving when it comes to what makes certain genres what they are. So, and a lot of them are going to mean different things to different people. But I'll start with the one that has a wider net to cast, 
and that is the concept of um, grimdark in fantasy. Now, yeah. I now um obviously the obviously the thing that cor that for a lot of people, especially in geek circles, corners the market on what would be considered grimdark is um Warhammer forty thousand. And I'm, and I'm not saying that's because Games Workshop is paying me, because the idea that Games Workshop would spend money on something is laughable. <laughs> <clears throat> but that is what people have a lot of word association with that. But what what does gr what does grimdark mean in your interpretation? In my interpretation, uh, I would, I mean, personally, I'd classify Grimdark in terms of, of fiction and novels as being a type of fantasy that is a much more realistic um, version of kind of your more classic Tolkien-esque fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of characteristics that Grimdark has, um, in my mind, would be things like and kind of moral ambiguity of characters so there's very much the theme of uh, the anti-hero and the kind of different shades of grey in terms of like morals and the choices that the characters make um, and I think Grimdark is, is much more of a kind of study um, of how humans interact on a I'd say a much more simple level than you would get in kind of a high fantasy where there's things like magic and dragons and prophecies and things that you've got going on. It's it's mm -hmm. coming very much down to kind of the basic choices that completely normal people would make, you know, if they were in these particular situations. Um, I know that kind of there's all sorts of different interpretations that other people have got in terms of what Green Dark should include in like in terms of kind of the levels of violence or the levels of kind of very dark content. But I think for me, Grimdark is, it's more about kind of how human nature comes into play in dark scenarios, if yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the other the other aspect of that is, in the, in the case of We Men of Ash and Shadow, is Gas Lamp. Now... I can, in, given my own experiences, I can infer what's intended to be meant by a t by a term like gas lamp. But I'm cu I'm curious where I'm curious how you how you nail it down and where it might differ from some people's interpretation of say steampunk. So with the the whole gas lamp kind of categorization, it wasn't really something that I had realized was a, was an actual category that you could use until I think one of my original beta readers had read the book and said to me, um, I think they asked, had, had I read a book uh, which was by, uh, I believe it was Susanna Clarkson, which was uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Mm -hmm. And that was the first I knew of kind of gas lamp. Um, so gas lamp is, uh, it's, basically considered to be like Victorian Edwardian set stories or at least stories that kind of have the aesthetics of it. The way in which it differs from steampunk would be that whereas steampunk would rely very heavily on kind of the technology of the era, with Glass Lamp you're looking more at the kind of the organic changes to like so social structure, like the shifts in kind of um, social structure, because I can't think of a better word <laughs> than that. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's it's the same kind of vibe in terms of like aesthetics and how the world would look, but mm -hmm. it's kind of, it's a lot more about the, the natural side of it. So, you know, it's, it's your kind of your human sciences, your biological sciences, your political sciences, rather than, you know, straight technology. Yeah, and something that something that I did no, something that I I did I did notice to a deg to a degree when it come when it came to how the book was um, being was being described is there's it seems it seemed like there was a small element of the 
of the kind of things that we see in noir. Um, in particular, the in particular the idea of um, building everything around a specific um, urban setting, and that particular place being kind of a labyrinth. And when, when I say yeah, labyrinth, I, I mean I mean that in the um, in the Greek myth kind of approach, you know, corridors leading to more corridors, and do and best pray that around that corridor isn't the Minotaur. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I when I was kind of planning out the city, um, I mean, there, there was two real motivators for me in the way that I, I built that world. Number one being that I knew I didn't want to build a whole world. And obviously, with a lot of fantasy, what you've got is great kind of continents and rolling mountains. And, you know, I, I'm far too lazy for that. You know, I, I need a smaller space to work with it. So that was kind of motivator number one. Uh, but also I wanted to really create this very constrictive, suffocating kind of industrial feel to it as well. So, um, you know, the whole idea of kind of the different alleyways and the, the tunnels and all these things that all kind of lead to the same places and it's really easy to get lost in it. I, I wanted that to kind of reflect how all the characters that are within the city are just kind of trapped in you know kind of very dark grim lives that you know it doesn't appear that there is any escape from so yeah it was very much a conscious choice to make it as kind of suffocating as possible yeah I c which i can i can definitely see and get and given the um given the way technology was bending in that more edwardian um victorian st um, styling. There's definitely going to be a whole lot of inescapable because a whole because well the well the air quality sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. The, but um. The the reason I br the reason I bring up something the reason I bring up something like noir especially is no is it when um when I was asked a long time ago about what the core theme with with noir is the the um the response that i gave in a word is cynicism because that that was a uh, that was a literary and, f and film genre that came around right after the end of the first world war and you had a lot of people coming back coming back who had seen stuff that nobody should be seeing and that and that kind of tinged their um up, their approach. And when I look at the set, when I look at the setting that you have for We Men of Ash and Shadow, um, I kind of have that vibe that well, welcome to the city. It's a big industrial place and a complete shithole. I mean, pretty much that that's pretty much uh, that would be what they'd have on the kind of sign as you walked in. So. So yeah, I mean that's pretty much what I was going for. With I mean, with the the idea of noir, I think that's pretty on the money with mm. the the whole idea of the, the cynicism and I think having that kind of very jaded um, sense of reality. Um, yeah. And, and I, kind of a few people have commented on the whole the kind of noir vibe and uh, a couple of the influences that I had when I started writing it probably did kind of lean that way so uh, one of the influences that I had was um, Sin City um, but obviously the comic and then it, it was a film as well mm -hmm. I mean a couple of years ago now um, yeah but the the, so the, that... gl the glory days when Frank Miller actually had a hand on his head on his shoulders and hadn't gone completely bat um, well pardon my French but bat shit crazy yes yeah, before the, the slide began. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was—I mean, there was that one, and then there was um, like uh, Watchmen as well, which was Alan Moore. That was a big influence um, for me, uh, and also some of the kind of really the old school kind of detective, like uh, you got like Raymond Chandler, that kind of vibe as well. So that did play a part in helping me to kind of build the world that the book is set in.
I'm cu I'm curious if um if what if one of the things that was an influence as well was Philip Marlowe. Yes, yes, very much. I mean, he I remember reading uh Philip Marlowe stories from uh, probably about 15, 16. Uh, and it was very definitely kind of in the back of my mind. I mean, I probably haven't read them for a good 10 years, but it's just one of those characters that just, it just sticks yeah. in your mind, I think. I'll, especially since that was the one that kind of provided the template for the whole um, hard-boiled detective approach, which... The that does that um does bring me to want to to one other thing. When it comes to a lot of when it comes to a lot of noir, a lot of um in, a lot of introspective style storytelling, you tend to you tend to see a fair amount of inner mo inner monologue. And while some people have treated that in into a bit of a into a bit of a meme over the years, as time will do that to just about anything. The uh, the way I've, the way I've always seen it is you is. Those sort of monologues are there to provide, um, perspective in terms of how somebody is thinking because, the uh, story is isn't going to be involving a large cast so you need to so. When you when you don't have a whole lot of people to talk with you end up talking with yourself. Mm. Um, it when it comes, is there. Is there that kind? Is there that kind of inner digression a lot with um, Vanguard within um, the book? Um, I mean, I think there is, in a sense, um, and you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to back myself into a corner a little bit here, but I know that you know a lot of people like to see huge amounts of of dialogue, but obviously, mm -hmm. like you've said, when you your character is internalizing everything, you can't have kind of huge great conversations because that just doesn't fit in with where the character is yeah. so a lot of what's told through vanguard's perspective is uh, you don't so much kind of know what he's feeling as you do kind of sense it so it's not so much explained which mm -hmm. i think some people might find that find the character a little standoffish because of that um but really i think for me, when I was building his character, I knew that this is a guy who is, he's kind of very jaded, very cynical, but he's also kind of very traumatized. And he's obviously he's been through a, he's been through a war. He's been through he's been to prison. So, you know, he's been in all of these situations where he's had so much kind of internalized. But, you know, now it's it doesn't come out like it would we've made a character who hadn't been through that mm -hmm. so you know to, to some people he might come across as being standoffish to, to other people he comes across as being kind of introspective you know and, and I, I, I love him either way so <laughs> you know he's it was what was right for the character when I yeah. wrote it and that does bring me to to one other um one other bit of genre interpreting that I that I wanted to get that I wanted to delve into, um, and that is gothic because there's definitely elements of of go of gothic storytelling with it with in this. Um, how do you inter how do you interpret what makes a story gothic? From kind of my own experience of reading, kind of gothic literature because that's probably i would say other than fantasy is my favorite genre to read mm -hmm. there isn't a huge amount of distinction really between uh the gothic kind of horror and the gas lamp kind of grim dark kind of it's all very much the same aesthetic it's all kind of the same eras i think the main difference is that with the gothic it leans much more into the supernatural and the horror elements as opposed to the kind of magical fantasy so with you know, you're gothic, you've got things like your Jekyll and Hyde and uh, Dorian Gray. Um, Try to give another example. So, uh, Interview with the Vampire, that's a slightly kind of more modern uh, yeah. example of it. Person, personally, I, um, the thing, the thing with, the thing with all of the ones that you mentioned, 
is that you can you can kind of sum, you can kind of summarize the theme with a lot of them in the monster that is man. Yeah. Oh. Definitely. And it's I'd say I'd say another I'd say another big example and probably the probably the biggest example in, on that front would be um, Frankenstein. Yeah. Um. I mean, po possibly if I wanted to if I wanted to squint at it sideways, I could bring up Bluebeard's Bride, but um, I'd rather not bring up Bluebeard's Bride because <laughs> I was way too young to be reading that when I did. Yeah, yeah, I think um, you know, there's there's a couple of core examples there, but yeah, I think you you're on the money there. It is mm -hmm. the it's the the monsters that kind of are within us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all, I think that's also the reason why um, why something why something like that leans it's lean, lends itself well to to kind to kind of a dark fairy tale approach. Mm -hmm. Simply because with a, with a lot of fairy tales, there's some there's there's some sort of um, I don't want to I don't want to say lesson because I because I think that would be too loaded, but some sort of of cultural reflection within a, within a lot of um, within a lot of fairy tales in various cultures, and it's the reason yeah. why there's there's the um, there's the for, the um, for the four authors meme. You know, the the Amer the American author, I will die for freedom. The French author, I will die for love. The British author, I will I will die for honor. The Russian author, I will die. I haven't actually I haven't actually seen that one, but um, I don't know if I would die for honor. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I don't... I'm sure there'd be something I would die for, but I'm not sure it, it would be honor. It's ma it's mainly there to take the piss on classical literature from all f from e from each relative country, and mostly to take the piss out of um, Russian cynicism when it comes to writing. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm gonna have to have a look at that one. Yeah, um, but when it comes to when it, com when it comes to when it comes to gothic fiction, I'm get there. I guess I would I would guess that the monster that is man that's represented in your book is <clears throat> the fact that this the the city it's that um that Vanguard has spent a lot of time seeing the worst humanity has to offer, and that's kind of colored him. Would that be accurate? Yes. Definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's very accurate. Um, this, you know, this guy's just not had like a great life. He's, you know, he's been to war not just within kind of his own country, but kind of across different places around the world that he's in. He's mm -hmm. he's been into prison, uh, and now he's kind of at the beginning as we come into the book. He's now employed by this corrupt kind of city official um, in a job that he doesn't want to be doing. And he's just kind of seeing, you know, the, the worst of the worst of people and really being stuck in this kind of situation that mm -hmm. he can't really help himself out of. Yeah. Now, I've um, I've talked a lot about world building with ver with various people on, on the show and, out and outside of it. And... Something I'm curious about when it comes to this, when it comes to the city, is did you end up did you end up conceptualizing parts of parts of the city even before you started even before you started writing the book proper, um, just as as a means to have a backdrop. And I'm not saying make an entire make an entire city map. You're not DMing this, but make the but more more that make the city a character in and of itself. I mean, from what I kind of remember, I think the the city itself um, started in just kind of these random patches that I kind of uh, visualised, and I think I did like little background scenes where I was writing up kind of what was where. But the the real kind of building block for me was the the canals that they have there, because I knew I wanted to have 
a defining feature within the the city itself that could kind of be everywhere and you know run from place to place but i didn't want it to be something that was natural like a, a river mm-hmm. so i started building this kind of image of this great uh, almost kind of london docks like canal with these great kind of shipping containers and you know barges and things coming in and out and then i think the city kind of grew around that so um and you know there were times where i'd have to kind of double back on myself and i think okay so like this part of the canal starts here and then this goes to this bit here and kind of backtrack but you know it didn't kind of grow it more just kind of sprang up in different places until it became a a sort of city Which that ma- that definitely makes sense. Now, when it ca- now when it comes to when it comes to the um, the can the um, canals, was it a, was it a case where you where you um, had had set up kind of it, kind of its kind of its own network of them that runs through the, that runs through the city because i i will admit when you mentioned canals one of the first things that came to mind was am i get, am i going to be dealing with a ver, with a um with a get with a gas lamp version of venice are we dealing with that much water or are we dealing with less <laughs> um, i mean I, de- I wouldn't say it was a gas lamp version of venice i mean I, I, I definitely don't think it's anywhere near as nice as that would be um I mean, in terms of the the canal, I kind of based it on, I mean, I just don't know what people's knowledge of UK geography is, but not too far from me is Liverpool, mm-hmm. which um, they kind of have, um, obviously they've got like the, the Mersey. So it was kind of designed off how the Mersey works, even though I know that that's not, you know, technically a canal. So it's kind of you're very kind of big, open wide kind of shipping area but then kind of gradually going into like your smaller canals that kind of offshoot and go in different directions so that would be used for their transport links so you know it's certainly not in the sense that venice is a big part of the the city for daily life but certainly in terms of you know industry and transport and kind of economics it would be a big big feature yeah and were the were a, were a lot of the places within within the books loosely inspired by um, areas you've been to? I think there was a few. Um, I mean, some of it is just purely made up from my own kind of ridiculous imagination. But I mean, where I live, I grew up not too far away from canal, a kind of canal where there was a lot of disused industrial space. So. There were kind of all these, you know, amazing, beautiful 1900s uh, foundries and factories that had just been abandoned and left to kind of ruin. So they played a lot of inspiration in terms of like the buildings and the the areas of the city that were more kind of down downtrodden. But mm-hmm. I mean, the, the other side of the city is the city that's the part that's really you know, new and shiny and beautiful. And, and that was pretty much just out of the depths of my imagination. <laughs> All right. I can, so I can, I can definitely, um, I can definitely see that. And to be fair, everyone's imagination is on some level ridiculous. That's why it's imagination. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know what it says about me, about the fact that all the, the parts of the city in my story that are inspired by reality are all the really dark, dingy, horrible ones, and then all the ones that are imagined are the really nice ones. So, <laughs> Well, you are, you are writing a grim, dark story, so truth in advertising? This, you, this is it. Like, this is it. <laughs> um, now, when... Now, um... How now? Obviously, I obviously I won't be able to look at a um, a full a full page count. But how how long did it take you to get to go through the um, first dra- to go through the first draft of the book? And how many um, 
How many ed how many editing passes did you end up going through? If you oh can... my, I didn't know. I have no idea. Um, I know that when I first started writing the book, it was just so completely different to how it ended up. I mean, I knew the main, the core of the story that I wanted, but. I mean, originally when I wrote it, the John Vanguard, who is the main character, was um, part kind of man, part machine, mm. kind of. There was a lot of like automatons and, and things like that involved. And I think maybe in like the second draft, they, they went out the window. Um, so I think from when I first kind of started it to taking it to editing was probably about eight, nine months in total. Um and then I think editing, I, I don't know how many versions we went through. I remember because I had um, a really great editor um, called Charlotte who was just amazing because she would start editing one draft and then before she'd finished that, I would have changed like a whole like chunk of it and then have to send it to her again. And, you know, she was just really patient with me, which was great. But I don't know, a lot. <laughs> Somewhere between like five and fifteen, I think edits we went through. And I'm get I'm um, guessing there I'm guessing there were there was at least one instance of of a certain part getting getting sent back and with the message of do it again. Yeah, I mean I think there was more than one part where I got that message. Um, like I said, there was kind of a lot of stuff that was originally in that we kind of threw out and just, we, you know, I think at the time it kind of felt like it would work. But now I think kind of seeing where it is now and looking back, you know, I'm I'm quite glad that, you know, I got those messages. <laughs> Otherwise, I think it would have been quite a different story. Mm -hmm. And what when it came when it now obviously for a lot of people there's the tr the tricky part is um going from an idea in someone's head about a story to actually um put actually putting pen to paper on that were there certain parts when it came to when it came to um storytelling that were a little bit tr were a little bit of mo a little bit more of a learning process for for you in that transition I mean, there definitely were in terms of some of the, the characters that I had. Um, I mean, I had some characters that just straight off the mark were just, I, I knew who they were and what they were going to do. But then there were kind of a few others where, you know, I started off with one idea for them and then that didn't work or the interactions with the other characters weren't working. So uh, there's a character in the book who is called Cook and he is a politician and originally he was supposed to be a like an art like a general kind of commander very kind of military and just that was not working at all for me so I kind of rebuilt him completely having already written the rest of the story and just had to kind of shape everything kind of around all his chapters to make it work which actually in the end I, I much preferred the character that he became with the finished draft but yeah that was just I mean that really threw me for a good kind of couple of months trying to work out what I was going to do with him I knew I didn't want to lose him but yeah he just he was not working as he was at first mm -hmm. and so and so I'm, get, I'm guessing in that case you had to um did you have to just re did you have to just rewrite how it how it was going or blow it up and start fresh? Um, I mean, I didn't quite have to blow it up and start fresh, but I definitely had to. I mean, any kind of chapters that he was involved with, I couldn't really rewrite them as they were, so they they were completely redone. Um, so that kind of took up, you know, a little bit of time. But I think in the end what his character was representing was just kind of the wrong the wrong thing so it was worth investing that time i think to to make it that he kind of did fit in with the, the world you know and 
to be, there's not a huge amount of, of characters in there who could be called the good guys. So, um, you know, and I, I think he, he kind of represents the minority. So I just, I didn't really want to lose another one of the good guys because then it would get kind of ridiculously dark. And th that's that's an interest that's an interesting point to to make when it comes to go when it comes to going um going into a dark a dark storytelling without going to going too far off the, off the other end um when wh when it came to the decision to write to write it as a grim as a grim dark story um were you were you fairly conscious of, of the idea of not making sure that you didn't go too far into the dark end of things that there's some that there's some sort of light to balance it out even if this is on the um on the cynical end of sto of storytelling yeah i mean I, I think that's just kind of part of the whole human nature element to it to be honest is you know we've I've, I've kind of said it a few times is that you can take an, a lot of things away from people, but you could you can't take someone's kind of sense of humor, even if it is a cynical or a jaded sense of humor. You know, you see kind of examples of it in kind of gallows humor, and you know, I don't know what the term is, but kind of military humor, if you will, where you know people are in horrible situations, and you have to have that kind of lightness to almost to rehumanize kind of what's going on around you mm. so i mean i've always in anything i've written tried to put an element of kind of comedy and humor into it um but it's it is a hard line you know it's you don't want to go too far into being too dark but at the same time you know i always think people have different levels of tolerance for dark so you know i've had people say to me that my writing is way too dark for them and they just don't they, they just don't like the level of darkness and then i've had other people say that you know what it's kind of on um, it's not that dark so i think it just depends on the person really mm -hmm. and what their interpretation of dark is yeah and i will ad i will admit the way the way you brought that up um made me think of something that one of my mentors had said where the where um he had lamented that a lot of people have the wrong in, have the wrong interpretation of the phrase comic relief like a lot of people associate that with mm -hmm. annoying characters in fiction um yeah when in real in reality the um the emphasis with something like comic relief should be on the relief part you know the pressure valve to to um relax some of the tension that's built up before building tension back up again. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um other and I'd I'd say I'd say that's just as important for writers as it is for um readers cuz I already I already made the joke about some um, about <laughs> about Frank Miller going off the deep end. But you you compare that to say um, Junji Ito, who hit, who even though he's not very good with endings, he definitely um, deals with a lot of a lot of horrible stuff in his works, whether it be uh, whether it be in Uz Uzumaki or some of his more recent stuff. But outside of that, he's a complete goof. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of this image that people get sometimes, in that you know, if you if you write dark things where you make kind of like dark art and movies and things like that that you know you must be a really kind of dark person you know with, with terrible dark thoughts all the time but you know it's just it's not the way that people work you know and I mean for the characters kind of in my book you know they are in a situation where you know there are terrible things happening around them and it's it's just an awful kind of oppressive society and if you were in that situation and you didn't have that comic relief, that comedy, I mean, you just wouldn't get through it. You know, you've got to, you've got to have a, a reason or a motivation to be able to carry on going. And just those little, like the sparks of humanity and humor, that, you know, that's what keeps you, you know, from completely giving up, really. Mm -hmm. Um. The other thing that comes to mind is something that Mel Brooks had once said when it comes to when it comes to dark comedy. Um, 
Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die. <laughs> Which, not exactly how not exactly how I would have phrased it personally, but I see where he was <laughs> going with it. Yeah, yeah, the, um, that's yeah. You can see you can see the message behind it definitely. Uh, I'm not sure that <laughs> I put it, like word it quite like that, but yeah, mm -hmm. I can see where that came from. And when it and in that in that same in that same vein, you you there needs to be some there needs to be some some sort of mechanism to release pre the pressure valves. That's why um. That's why in in in, pla in places like California, they'll start small um, they'll start small fires so that bigger ones don't happen. Yeah. And given and given that um, now, if I'm not mistaken, this year this is um, We Men of Ash and Shadow is the first part in a series. Yeah. yeah. Um. Was that what was it always your intent to have it to have this be a um a series of books or was it originally that it was just going to be a one off that just um you just found out that there was way too much um potential in that particular sandbox? No, I, I kind of straight up from the get go. I knew this was going to be a series. I mean, I I knew almost straight away what the character arcs were going to be for most of the main characters in it. Um, and there was just no way that that was going to fit over kind of the course of, of one book or even two. So I think it's the general idea is that there will be four in the series. Um, and I know kind of which way they're going to go and, and how they're going to get to the end. So, you know, it was, it was always mapped out as a kind of a series. All right, that <clears throat> that def that definitely makes sense. Um, when it now, given now, given all given all of that, what would you say? What would you say are some were some of the biggest takeaways that you've had um, post re post releasing the first book? Oh, like in terms of the uh... learning experience of of writing in this level. I think, I mean, because I went self-published, but it was the, there was a whole learning curve to that kind of side of it as well. Um, in terms of learning about my own writing and my own style, um, no, it's, that's, it's a good question. I think the answer probably changes on a daily basis. Uh, I mean, I would definitely say that my takeaway is that oh my god, I don't even know. Um, I mean, it's it's difficult. I think. I mean, it's early days for the book as well. Um, I mean, I think that I'm, I trusted my instincts on a lot of the the decisions I made. You know, in terms of we mentioned earlier about the character, and especially with Vanguard, about him being a very kind of internalized character. So. You know, I think one of the big learning curves for me was learning how to make that character more human when he's not kind of emoting or expressing a lot. So, you know, that was that was a good thing to learn. Um, I mean, definitely in terms of getting the book out there um, and going through the whole editing and publishing process, I think I, I learned a lot in terms of um, just like the mechanics of, you know, publishing and marketing and promoting. So, I mean, that hopefully will mean it will be easier next time. <laughs> because I think a lot of it has just been trial and error this time and just seeing if things work or not. Uh, it's a good question. I don't feel like I have a good answer for it, to be honest. And to be fair... Experience has taught me that the greatest innovations were done by people who had no clue what they were doing. That is hundred percent. Yeah, I'm. I have no idea what I'm doing half the time in anything. I just kind of go start doing things and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. 
but when when it comes to when it comes when it comes to something like this, obviously obviously it's a case of um ha as cliche as it would be to say to say having more passion than common sense, um, if the shoe fits then I gotta wear it. <laughs> But with all that said, I do want I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zones to come up to the temple. Oh no, thank you very much for having me. Um, it's it's been really good, and I apologize if I veered dangerously off topic many times. <laughs> like I like I said like I said, I both prepare and expect for things to go off the rails. Because because nine times out of ten they do. So don't worry don't worry about that. I think it's how you end up in the most interesting places half the time. So. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And like and um. I've had I've had a I've had enough experience where I can ju where I can just play things by ear. So when things go off the rails, um, it's. It's not. It's not a matter of I need to get things back on rails in panic mode. It's more of, now well, just let just let things ha just let things happen as they are. But anytime you see fit to return, whether it be on a future book, um, or to dis or to d or to discuss um anything geek related, or even just to glor even just to do a glorified shit post, um, <laughs> the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. That's, that's great. I will. I will remember that I've unfortunately finished my wine now, so I am going to have to <laughs> go and refill. <laughs> <laughs> and of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come on in and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>